Welcome everybody to the Primetime Podcast, hosted here on the MEG Nick YouTube channel. My name is Nick, and I hope you guys are doing well whenever you're checking out the latest episode of the podcast that talks about all things in the world of TV, news reviews, commentaries, and much more. This is episode number 14 for you guys here, and it is going to be a fun one. We are starting off a brand new kind of mini segment or a mini series within the podcast here today. And this is an idea that I've been uh, kind of uh, finding a way to incorporate into the show, um, something that I've wanted to do since the very beginning here, but never really had the chance until today here. And that is go over essentially the week uh, in review. So go over all the shows that I saw on TV throughout the week, give you my thoughts on these episodes and some of these premieres, and as well go over the Nielsen ratings for all of them as well and see how they compared to the rest of the playing field. This is an idea, like I said, that I've been do wanting to do for a little while, and the main reason why I chose this week to start it was because uh, through the week of January 2nd up until January 8th, which was last week as I record this, there were a lot of big shows that either came back to TV following a season hiatus or a midwinter finale or season premieres or series premieres for the winter schedule as we went over a few episodes ago. And I wanted to kind of give you my thoughts on some of them and see uh, kind of how they will progress throughout the rest of the season there uh, going forward. Because a lot of these new shows uh, had some really good starts and a couple of them had some really bad starts here. So kind of lay out all my thoughts for you guys. And as well, I'd love to hear what you have to say on these. If you saw any of these episodes, let me know. Did you like them? Did you not like them? What shows were you most excited for that came out? Which ones were you a little let down by? Any thoughts you have to say, I would love to read them in the comments. Before we actually get into the week, uh, you know, going through and we start breaking it all down, though, I do want to give you guys a look at the updated predictor cancellation table from Spoiler TV here. Um, something that we've gone over in a couple of the episodes of the podcast in the past, but kind of give us an updated look as of the 9th here of January, which was uh, last Sunday here. Uh, let's start off with the red here. Of course, these are the most likely to be canceled shows. A couple of them, uh, I would say, pretty much guaranteed to be canceled at this point. Definitely stuff like The Big Leap here. Currently the lowest rated show on TV here with a score of 1.2. Definitely just awful, awful uh, just kind of numbers that that one's giving us here. Um, that one got taken off the schedule or replaced with a different show that we'll talk about a little bit later called The Cleaning Lady, which just premiered there on the 3rd. Uh, the Big Leap here definitely not doing itself any favors uh, with the numbers that it's putting up. We also have some sitcoms in here from NBC, such as Grand Crew and American Auto, a couple shows that premiered uh, officially in this week as well on Tuesday that we'll go over. Um, the new medical drama from CBS, Good Sam, here had a very disappointing start. We'll talk about that a little more in depth later. And then we also have some shows that, again, from the fall, they're like our kind of people, Ordinary Joe. We've talked about those in the past, just not doing enough here to sustain themselves going into the spring here. Um, a couple season premieres that came out this week as well, such as Keenan in here. Um, very disappointing to see that one in the red as well. I really enjoyed season one, but season two was just not it right now. And again, looking like it will be canceled very quickly. Uh, as we scroll down to the yellow here, this is kind of the middle section. Some of these might survive uh, cancellation, but most of them, I would say, again, um, have a good, you know, more likely shot to um, get the axe come spring. Uh, those being like home economics, I think is definitely one bull as well on CBS. Um, home economics, easily their lowest rated sitcom at the moment, um, which is very disappointing considering, again, Topher Grace on that show. Um, very, very likable actor, of course, from that 70s show from back in the day, but this one just did not really live up to the hype. Um, this didn't really have enough marketing behind it and just kind of got the short end of the stick when it came to the schedule that it was uh, paired with, just kind of sandwiched in between some shows that were very disappointing as well there. So just not really doing itself any favors either there. Um, Bull, a lot of talk on this one as well. This one, I think currently in its sixth or seventh season on CBS here, um, just getting swamped by its competition, right? We got Law & Order Organized Crime going up against it, which is dominating the playing field right now. And Bull, unfortunately, just kind of taking the beating from those other bigger dramas that are more popular at the moment. Uh, Big Sky is another one that's kind of in that same ballpark, unfortunately, just getting pummeled by organized crime more specifically. 
Uh, we also have in here The Wonder Years on ABC, uh, of course, the updated version of the classic show from the 80s and 90s back in the day. Um, this one, again, very disappointing. I think last time we saw this, it was actually in the green. So at the beginning of its season, had a little bit more uh, sustainability to it, um, just kind of had more emphasis on the, um, you know, sort of plot and some of the characters as well. But uh, from what I can tell, going forward into the season, it was, again, not able to sustain itself whatsoever. Um, just kind of fumbled the ball as far as any potential that it might have had to recapture the audience from back in the day and kind of pull in a new generation of people to uh, share the great wonder years with. But it was just not able to do that at all there. Uh, we also have CSI Vegas in here. Uh, despite how bad its scores were and how kind of disappointing its ratings were, it does have a renewal already secured for season two here. Any in the blue that you see there have a, another season renewed. Um, and despite it being the lowest one of them, a lot of people arguing the reason behind it being the fact that um, it's a big name franchise, of course, CSI, one of the most popular series from back in the day as well, from the early 2000s, and that the international distribution of this show, surprisingly high on streaming services such as Netflix, that's where a lot of these shows tend to live on if they're live in numbers, as we see here, just aren't that good um, in certain demos as well, um, but it can actually survive, uh, you know, even exponentially uh, stronger on places like Netflix or Hulu where streaming numbers are up surprisingly well for um, some of these shows uh, despite their lack of the live numbers as a result. So this is kind of interesting as well on um, CSI Vegas in there. We also have The Cleaning Lady, like I said, brand new drama that premiered that we'll go over uh, a little more in depth uh, as we go breaking down all of the individual shows we're going to talk about this episode. We also have some of the new Fox uh, comedies as well, so just Pivoting just premiered. I had a pretty strong start. Um, it definitely had a great lead-in because it was the NFL game that premiered before it, so obviously had a lot of viewers sticking around for the comedies there. Uh, NCIS Hawaii as well in here, another show from the fall that's doing pretty well. Uh, Blackish, the first show on the schedule we see here with the purple marker, which is their final season here. So Blackish Season 8 will be its last one, and again, that's something we'll talk about a little bit more uh, later in the episode here. We also have some more comedies such as Ghost, Abbott Elementary, you can see there in the bold, also doing really well. Abbott Elementary, probably my favorite new comedy of 2022 here, which is fantastic, and definitely glad to see that it's finding its audience so quickly. Definitely a show that I can recommend to everyone there. And then as we get closer, of course, a lot of these bigger shows already on the schedule here have their renewals locked in, such as Station 19, Young Sheldon, Grey's Anatomy, SVU, the typical suspects you'd expect up there. Uh, the 911s as well doing very well. But surprisingly enough, anyone out there have a prediction for what the current biggest show on TV is? Because I can guarantee you it's not what you think. Uh, in the past, we've seen stuff like All American take that spot, The Simpsons, 911. All those very popular, critically acclaimed drama, sitcoms, whatever it is there. But this current number one show that just had its season premiere back on Sunday here, you would never expect it to be the most popular show on TV right now, which is Call Me Cat, with a score of 24.69 there. I don't know how that happened. I'm going to be completely honest with you. It was not a show that I expected to be anywhere near up here. But surprisingly enough, despite how dismal quality it has, it is surprisingly popular here and netted itself the top spot on this chart. Uh, as well as This Is Us as a runner-up here, which also premiered back in this week. That is going to be its final season as well, season six, so not as much um, importance placed on it because, you know, it's obviously not going to stick around for another season here. But Call Me Cat, your official number one biggest show on TV. With that in mind, let's jump into the actual schedules for each day here, break them down one at a time. I'll go over the shows that I saw this week and give you my thoughts on them. And then, like I said, we'll compare them as well to the rest of the field, see how well they did as far as the ratings go. So we're going to start off here with Sunday, January 2nd here. This was the first night of the week, of course. And Sunday is a packed day, not just on broadcast network TV like we're seeing here, but on cable as well with shows like Yellowstone premiering as well as Dexter New Blood, which, of course, uh, not this Sunday, the 2nd, but the Sunday afterwards, the 9th, 
had its series finale there, which we're not going to cover in this episode. There's already a lot of talk on it, but that was definitely a very competitive week as well, considering how much anticipation there was for that last episode there of Dexter. But looking at the January 2nd numbers here, let's go over them. Of course, on Fox, we had the NFL game, and then uh, following that, we had the premiere of Next Level Chef, which is surprisingly enough the only show on this entire chart that I watched uh, the week of. Typically on on uh, Sundays, excuse me, I would usually come home from work and my family and Matt, my brother, would always be watching the uh, cartoons that fall on Fox's schedule there on Sundays. So that's The Simpsons, Great North, Bob's Burgers, and Family Guy. Uh, but they weren't on this week. They had the premiere of Next Level Chef, which if you're not our excuse me, if you're not already familiar, is the new cooking competition show hosted by Gordon Ramsay and company. Really, really like this one so far. I'm a big Gordon Ramsay fan. Uh, watched a ton of his shows in the past, such as Master Chef and Hell's Kitchen. Extremely popular. And this one, despite how gimmicky it can be with its sets and the way that it's kind of formatted and such, I really like the presentation of it. And I think this one is definitely going to be very sustainable going forward here. Uh, the basic sort of gimmick is that there's three different kitchens that all of the contestants are cooking in here. The top kitchen is the most decked out, has the best equipment, it's the most pristine, it's got, you know, new updated, uh, beautiful equipment for them to use uh, to the, for them to make as good of dishes as they can possibly make. The middle kitchen is the most average, right? Not the best, not the worst, very just typical uh, commercial grade, you know, equipment there. Um, certainly not anything that you would necessarily want to have, like you would desire to have like the top kitchen, but you could certainly do a lot worse, which is what the bottom kitchen holds, which they call the basement on the show. Definitely the most run down, um, easily like the, you know, most beat up equipment there. Um, a lot of their, um, you know, utensils and stuff are all bent and kind of misshapen and stuff. Um, definitely a struggle down there if you're put in the basement to make your dish properly. Um, and then the other gimmick with it is that there's this huge platform that goes in between all three of the kitchens there. And that houses all of the different ingredients they would use to cook all the food on the show. So it, uh, it goes on the top level first. And they get the first pick of all the ingredients for the specific challenges there. They got the best cuts of meat, best organic vegetables, uh, you know, the best uh, wines or you know the most expensive brands of all these different products whatever you could imagine they have on the top level there they get the first pick of it then when it goes to the second level there's a couple decent things when it gets down there but most of it's already taken by the top floor there so they kind of have to be a little bit more creative in how they you know make this dish with what's left but by the time it gets to the very bottom level the basement like i said it is definitely the most challenging there's really really just kind of shitty ingredients that no one would want to use uh, it's very very difficult to make a really good dish when you're left with like stuff like spam and kind of the you know gross um not really uh you know fancy ingredients that a typical chef would want to use to cook their dishes with so that's the whole gimmick of it um there's kind of this rng that they go through to determine who is going to you know play on what kitchen and stuff but the other main gimmick of this show, which they actually borrowed from a different competition on TV right now called The Voice, of course, huge singing competition, is that all of the different judges on the show, there's Gordon Ramsay, there's celebrity chef Richard Blaze, and then there's another restaurateur celebrity chef named Naisha Arlington. And they all got to pick who's who they want on their team, right? Which contestants they think are the best, have the most potential that they want to coach and mentor throughout the rest of the season there. So in the first episode, which is what this one is, the premiere, of course, uh, they got to audition whose team they want to be on. And then they uh, all the judges got to pick kind of playground style uh, the contestants they want to coach throughout the season there. And that was another kind of level of this show that Gordon Ramsay shows typically don't have because they're usually not separated in teams like that. It's usually just every man for themselves. And it creates a lot of interesting sort of uh, scenarios and tensions throughout the challenges that you don't typically find on other competition shows like that when it's just kind of solo 
uh, you know, every contestant's on their own. This one is more of a team-based effort. So I like that sort of, uh, you know, twist that they have on this one that's a little bit more unique than some of the other cooking shows out there. So I personally really enjoyed this one. Of course, I might be a little biased because, like I said, I like cooking shows in general. I like Gordon Ramsay. Um, so this was right up my alley, right? But if you're not someone that likes uh, that sort of stuff, it's really not going to do anything that much different that's going to turn you into a Gordon Ramsay fan by watching this one. Uh, that being said, though, a lot of people also really enjoyed it here. As you can see, it had some really tremendous ratings here, uh, about 5 million viewers there live. Even going up against uh, Sunday Night Football on NBC was able to sustain itself and get second place, which is very, very impressive there. Um, 1.55 in the 18 to 49 demo is massive. That is absolutely phenomenal for a brand new show with a very niche audience. Of course, cooking shows don't really have that mass appeal. So to get over uh, 1.0 in the 18 to 49 demo is massive. Most shows, uh, even the most popular on TV, cannot hit that for the life of them. So to get you know that plus uh, another half there is tremendous like i said so that is awesome uh, on a part of gordon ramsay definitely thumbs up there uh, as far as any other big shows for the night aside from sunday night football there really wasn't anything else to write home about here just kind of your basic um you know shows that came back for new episodes following the hiatus there but like i said nothing else that i specifically saw that i have to give my thoughts on here so that is sunday night for you the big takeaway there next level chef definitely the big hit of the season there for reality TV. Let's move on to Monday, January 3rd here. We have a little bit more to talk about here. We have a lot of shows that have that green premiere label to them, so definitely a lot more conversation on this one. Starting off with Fox's 911 Lone Star. Now, confession here, uh, Monday in particular, um, I was just not really in the mood to watch any TV. I actually had a couple movies that I was uh, meaning to get to and found the time to watch them on Monday night here. So I actually missed out on all of these shows, watching them live. So a couple of these that I did see, I actually watched later on streaming here, including Lone Star, the season premiere of 911 there. Uh, I really like this one. The whole gimmick behind the season that they were kind of, um, you know, marketing behind and kind of trumping up in their advertising was it was going to draw parallels to what's going on in real life right now in Texas, which are these crazy huge winter storms that they're getting year after year. Uh, the last like two or three years, I think uh, they've had these just, you know, devastating winter storms, people losing power, people losing their homes to the snow and the ice that they're just not used to down there. Um, and this sort of season is going to uh, kind of take inspiration from that and uh, present some of those stories within the show, which I think is a really cool idea. I'm kind of taking after what like Law & Order used to do with the rip from the headlines, of course, taking real life stories and implementing them into these TV shows like that. 911 in general is very campy. It's very over the top. It's very silly. Um, you know, these big grand uh, sort of action set pieces they use really, really transpire well uh, for this more winter sort of setting with the snow and everything um really really cool to see on screen of course and this episode picked up exactly where the season two finale left off with with owen strand rob lowe's character um kind of being at the center of this uh in the previous season he was a little bit more um kind of outspoken and he was a bit of a rebel and stuff um kind of fighting back against the system here which he's kind of committed his life to for so long here but he's kind of fed up with right there's all these politics in the way all these things that he has to sign to that he's just you know done with and in the season the big um sort of moment uh in the previous episode was when he kind of hit back against his superior officer here and um it basically got him suspended from the force right because he's going up against authority and they threaten in the season to close down the firehouse where he works and you know where his whole team is and that's all the main characters on the show so this season picks up with him kind of going um to these hr meetings and kind of you know pleading his deal um as far as you know he has to apologize and he has to say sorry to this guy and you know that that way they can get uh the firehouse back and everything can kind of go back to normal but he's done with that you know he doesn't want to bow 
down to any of these people that he just doesn't agree with. They're not really fighting for what they believe in. They have different, you know, uh, kind of views on how these uh, first responders should, you know, kind of act as far as their position in society. And, you know, he's just fed up with it. So in this episode, he decides to retire. He goes up north, he finds this little cabin, um, and he gets away from it. And, you know, he's done with this job. He's committed, you know, decades of service to it, and he just wants to get out of there. But his whole team that looks up to him and stuff, they're all young guys. They really want to support him, and they want to keep this firehouse open. So throughout this episode, they kind of... Um, you know, visit him and stuff. And there's one character in particular who goes up there uh, in the winter storm, no less, to kind of plead with him to apologize and get things back on track. And throughout the episode, we see a lot of the other characters there move to different positions, right? Maybe they go to different firehouses in the state. They're working with other characters that they might just, you know, not get along with. They're kind of missing their uh, close uh, relationships that they've built within this other firehouse. Um, some of them work in different uh, sort of paramedic uh, type positions as well there. Uh, if they're an EMT, stuff like that. And they all kind of collectively join together towards the end of the episode when this massive winter storm uh, threatens to, you know, kind of tear up the city here in Austin. And that's when they all have to kind of band together and put their differences aside and come back together as a team there. And that's kind of where the ending of this episode leaves off with this kind of looming threat that, uh, you know, kind of falls over the city. And we get to see now throughout the rest of the season how they're going to respond to that. So I thought this was a pretty solid return for Lone Star here. I actually prefer this series uh, specifically for Rob Lowe. I think he's just a really talented actor in general. Um, and his performance here was really well, like I said, as Owen Strand. Uh, so I really thought this, this was a solid return for the show here. Um, definitely something that I'm going to keep up with here throughout the rest of the winter. Like I said, I like those parallels that they're drawing from real life. I think that's going to lead to some really great emotional scenes throughout this season. Let's also talk about the other Fox show that I happened to check out, again, later on streaming here, called The Cleaning Lady. I saw some buzz around the show uh, after it premiered. I didn't really expect too much of it. The only thing that I had heard about it uh, previously when we were going over the winter schedules and such is that it was a crime drama and that it was based on a pre-existing show, um, I believe a Cambo. Uh, Cambodian show uh, from like 2016 or 2017, something like that. Um, so again, you know, kind of this pre-existing IP that they're making a U.S. version of essentially. So I didn't really have that high of expectations for it. I don't think a lot of people did either. But because of strong marketing behind the fact that it's a crime drama and it kind of falls in line with 911 as well, kind of similar uh, sort of styles there, a similar demographic that would want to watch both shows, it actually had a pretty strong premiere here, uh, about 3.6 million viewers here, uh, 5 one for the demo of the 18 to 49 and that's pretty uh, solid for a brand new show without, you know, much uh, traction here in the U.S. basing uh, itself off of a international adaptation like it is. Um, it's actually a much better start than where uh, the, uh, what was it called, The Big Leap, rather, um, had back in the fall after the original line one won, that one premiering with, I think, only like 1.5 million or something like that. So definitely a much better return uh, here for The Cleaning Lady. And I also saw it had some pretty good reviews, uh, both from audience and critics there on sites like Rotten Tomatoes, and uh, some comments on Spoiler. I saw some people praising it as well. So I wanted to check it out, right? See what all the hype was about. And after watching it, I see why a lot of people enjoy it. I do. I think the crime drama sort of style and such is still very, uh, you know, commendable for a lot of these shows to take on. I think it's still. Uh, has has a lot of potential left in it, but for me personally, I am just a little bit, uh, you know, bored of these types of shows. I think the whole idea of these anti heroes and um, you know people putting themselves in these positions of risk to do something for their family, it just kind of all feels the same, like we've seen on other shows prior, like Breaking Bad or something like that. 
um, where this, you know, central lead character is just kind of very mundane, um, you know, doesn't really have a lot going on in their in their real life, and then is thrown in a situation where they have to kind of step up and be the hero for everybody, but do it in a morally questionable way. And the cleaning lady is nothing more than just that, but with this filter of it being based on a Cambodian show to begin with. Um, so there's nothing really special here about it. The basic plot is that the main character named Tony is this um, sort of, she works for this company who does a lot of catering events like weddings and different, um, you know, sports events and stuff like that. And she is one of the cleaning ladies that they have. So essentially just like a janitor pretty much um, who goes around and, and cleans up the venues when the event in question is done. And in the first episode, we see that one of the first jobs that is shown to us on the show is this event that goes on during this underground boxing ring. Uh, the leader of this club sets up this event for his daughter's birthday, and in the middle of it, there's a situation where he says to one of the boxers that you have to purposely, you know, fall down. You have to purposely fake losing, essentially, because we get a lot of these mobster guys here, and they're betting on you to lose, and, you know, we need that to happen in order for this to be, you know, sustainable and stuff, and, and for them to be happy because they're real powerful guys and they don't want to lose all their money. So, of course, boxing in general has that sort of, like, you know, um, like criminal kind of background and stuff and that's a very um common trope you see with a lot of these like underground fight rings and stuff like that um that they're all rigged and that there's purposely um certain scenarios that play out so that these people win or lose depending on what they want to happen um but essentially this character um is fed up with that right she doesn't want to do that and she thinks that it's all bullshit and you know she's kind of fighting against the system again so she ends up beating the shit out of the other boxer and winning which is not what this owner you know was was told was going to happen and so all these big powerful gangster guys uh, end up losing all their money and when they come back to confront the guy they end up killing him and while all this is going on, Tony is still at the venue and she's just doing her job. She's kind of, you know, unaware that all of that went down and that these guys are really pissed now. So she ends up getting caught by these guys and pleads for her life, right? She says she will just do anything to get out of the situation. She really wants, um, you know, to be alive, of course. And, you know, these guys are really powerful. So she ends up cleaning up all the evidence for them, gets rid of the body, cleans up all the blood, leaves no trace that any of this went down so that these guys will get away and that the police and stuff won't come looking for them. And there's no suspicious sort of, you know, clues left that these guys were attached to this crime. And because they're so impressed with the job that she did, where she was just able to clean everything up so you know pristinely they end up hiring her for this position where she's on call whenever they need a situation that needs cleaning up whenever there's a murder that goes down or they you know do something in a venue where they shouldn't be you know depending on the situation they'll call her and they'll ask her to just you know get rid of it all and in return they're going to give her a shit ton of money that she's going to use to pay for these treatments that her son needs in order to survive he has a life-threatening disease where he needs to be quarantined all the time. She's not getting the response she needs from these doctors. Um, her visa is about to expire, and that causes a lot of conflict with her son getting these treatments. If she gets deported, she won't have those opportunities and those resources like we do here in the States. So she accepts this money kind of begrudgingly because she knows that, obviously, morally, it's kind of wrong what these guys are up to, but she needs to you know, help her son out, and she needs to support her family. So again, it doesn't have the most original concept behind it. It does draw a lot of parallels from other shows like we've seen in the past, but I can see why a lot of people still love that, right? If you're a huge fan of those, you know, sort of uh, anti-hero stories, crime drama type stories, I think you're really, really going to like this. And for a lot of people, that is still a genre that is very, very, uh, you know, flooded with potential and creativity still even in 2022. And this show definitely showed a lot of that in its first episode. It's just not really a style that I necessarily gravitate towards all the time. So I felt a little bit more mixed on it, but I can see why a lot of other people really enjoyed this show. And like I said, if that's something that you know sounds like you would enjoy, I think it's going to be right up your alley there.
Now, outside of that, uh, there were a couple other shows that had some season premieres here that I wanted to go over. Of course, the big one uh, that you see there at the top of the ratings was The Bachelor here. Had a huge 18-49 to 49 demo. Despite not having the best viewership, even still, uh, The Bachelor is just super sustainable all these years later. I have never understood it myself because it's obviously not a genre where I would want to watch that kind of stuff. Reality TV competitions like that those dating shows just not really for me um, but it still has a huge market out there so obviously it's going to do very well as far as its popularity concerns but the one that I was kind of uh, disappointed by but also um, just kind of you know interested in talking about here was Keenan it's season two premiere here uh, like I said earlier I really like season one of Keenan uh, it was actually one of my favorite shows of 2021 when it came out back in February last year uh, and season two premiered this year with its Christmas special and then they're going to have the um, you know rest of the show play out for the rest of the winter here into the spring but the ratings here just not on their side uh, only about two million viewers here definitely uh, even lower for its second episode at 8 30 there 1.6 million viewers here and this is something that I'm going to talk about a little bit more um, when we go into two Tuesday's ratings, but NBC in general just does not have a very good track record with their modern comedies right now. Um, every single sitcom that they have on TV right now, whether it's Keenan, whether it's Grand Crew, Mr. Mayor, Young Rock, whatever it is, all of them premiered in 2021 or 2022. So the oldest shows that they have are literally only a year old at this point, only have one season in. They, at the moment, do not have any sort of sitcom that has a sustainable legacy behind it, right? They don't have like a Goldberg equivalent on ABC where it has, you know, nine seasons in where it's been on since the 2010s, right? Where it has just a, a huge fandom behind it that will rally together. They don't have anything that Fox has with their cartoons, right? The Simpsons or Family Guy that have been on for 20 or 25 years at this point. They just don't have anything like that right now. The closest they did back last year was Superstore, which had been on since 2015, but that ended last year. So at this point, they're just kind of, you know, waiting for that next big hit and they're just struggling to find it right now and that really kind of disappoints me personally because NBC I love their dramas right anything with that they've done uh, with the Chicago shows or with Law and Order I think I mean those are huge success stories for them Dick Wolf of course kind of perpetuating a lot of that for them as kind of their go-to creator producer uh, for you know, all of those big uh, drama shows but with their sitcoms they just don't have anything like that right now and that's really hurting them uh, and their bottom line when it comes to these averages here and Keenan as you can see there is one of those examples that just isn't doing enough for them right now uh, for them to make a you know grand case for themselves in the comedy sphere so that's kind of disappointing uh, to see but comedy in general is kind of just something that's on its way out unfortunately um, all the networks kind of struggling with that and like I said we're going to talk about that a little more in depth as we go through the rest of this episode here but as for now uh, on Monday uh, you know just to kind of wrap this segment up 911 Lone Star I thought was really good the cleaning lady I had a little more of a mixed feeling there I'm going to definitely continue with Lone Star cleaning lady I might catch on streaming every now and again but just not really something for me personally and then everything else here like I said just wasn't really that interested in checking out any of the other big premieres on Monday there so with that in mind let's jump to Tuesday here January 4th this was another big day with uh, shows that I really wanted to watch specifically on ABC here um, not anything that was like super super amazing or you know super huge um, like we'll see a little bit later but definitely some stuff that piqued my interest and piqued my curiosity starting with judge steve harvey here at eight o'clock uh now typically i would watch the fbi shows but when you hear the title judge steve harvey your mind wanders your mind goes places that it probably wouldn't um and that sounds pretty interesting <laughs> you know um, Steve Harvey, of course, is just a massive figure in the world of entertainment and TV, whether he's on Family Feud, his daytime talk show, his radio show. He's had just a ton of different hosting gigs over time. Huge comedian, of course. Uh, one of my favorites on TV as like one of these go-to daytime hosts. And the idea of him doing one of these judge kind of, you know, court 
type of shows like a Judge Judy or Judge Joe Brown or someone like that uh, just, you know, sounded really interesting because he doesn't have experience in that sort of background. He's not, you know, a judge in real life. He doesn't have a law degree. Um, so his kind of, you know, a grounded approach to some of these cases I thought was going to be an interesting, you know, sort of style on it. And I think this show does some stuff right in the form that it just lets Steve Harvey be Steve Harvey. You can't box him into anything. You can't really cage him. He, when he just goes off on his comedy segments, he just goes off. And it's one of the funniest things you can find, right? If you just want to look up, like, his stand-up routines from back in the day, or even, like, on Family Feud and stuff, there's some segments where he just goes off on some of these contestants that give the stupidest answers, right? It definitely draws parallels to that on the show. And they let him just be Steve Harvey here, which I think is the best-case scenario because... The actual, like, sort of, you know, routine, judge, arbitration type show, I think is super boring. I think it's super fucking boring, man. Judge uh, Judy or the People's Court or any of those very vanilla, basic-ass courtroom shows, they just put me to sleep. I do not understand how those are popular whatsoever. Because these people are just so uninteresting, you know, and these cases are so dumb and so trivial most of the time. So allowing Steve Harvey to just come out and bring the personality, I thought was the best move. The problem, though, with this show is at the end of the day, it's still an arbitration court show, right? Like, there's no hiding that. And the people behind it just drag it down, man. You just want to see Steve Harvey, you know, be Steve Harvey. And these segments just absolutely pull the whole pacing down and everything. Like, the laughs just stop when they're just pleading out their cases and stuff. It is just dreadful. Um, and I don't know if it's always going to be like this, but the, towards the end of this episode as well, like, the last, like, 10 minutes or so, it got super serious it got super heavy-handed man and there were no laughs in it it was dead silent people were crying um i don't really want to you know talk about it because it's not that super interesting but one of the cases they had at the end was like just super like you know emotional and stuff and serious it was just like such a weird sort of tone shift you know in the show going from you know this this crazy outlandish steve harvey type show to just like being super quiet super like dead silent just you know uh, laser focused on on the emotion of it all uh it was just a really weird shift in tone so i don't know how well this is going to sustain itself it had a pretty damn good premiere um considering just the like kind of you know wild factors of of steve harvey and such um and it it did pretty well as far as its ratings go. Five million people. I mean, that's pretty damn good, especially for ABC this season. Um, close to tying for the top spot in the 18 to 49 demo alongside FBI, which is just a juggernaut right now. Um, this, um, excuse me, this episode of FBI in particular as well um, was actually the top rated episode as far as live viewership goes so far this year. 8.5 million viewers here. For this season, uh, you know, kind of mid-season premiere here uh, following the hiatus that it had over the holidays here. Uh, so that's huge for FBI. So shout out to that. Um, but Steve Harvey, you know, he held its own, uh, which was pretty surprising. Let's move on as well to the show that I was super excited to watch here. Uh, my favorite show that we talked about earlier for 2022 here, Abbott Elementary on ABC. Um, that's the main reason why I watched Judge Steve Harvey, because I was just waiting for Abbott Elementary to come on. So I figured, you know, what the hell, I'll kill this hour. And I like Steve Harvey, so there you go. But really, I was waiting out for Abbott Elementary here, which did really well for itself as well here. Um, 3.4 million viewers. That's actually up uh, almost a million viewers uh, for where its premiere was back in December there. Um, I think a lot of word of mouth has really kind of shaped this show into what it is now. And and it's really kind of, you know, making the rounds online. I've seen a lot of more people talk about it, which is great. Um, it had a huge marketing blitz as well on ABC. They did a really good job kind of putting the show out and talking about how it has a 100% rating on Rotten Tomatoes and throwing the, you know, how well its critical reception has been so far, um, as well as just the fact that it's a, you know, kind of modern workplace mockumentary style, very similar to that of like The Office or Parks and Rec as well. I've seen people draw comparisons to. Um, and those shows obviously are very popular and very well, even after... Um, you know, years and years of their, um, 
since their premiere, rather, um, they're still super, super popular in syndication and on um, streaming services and such on Netflix. So um, this is just a show that works really well in the sort of modern day era of sitcoms, these mockumentary types. And this show is one of the best that I've seen in a very long time. Uh, I actually liked the second episode more than the first one. I thought it had some really interesting um, developments for some of its characters. I really like um, Tyler James Williams on the show as well. I think he's great. Um, everyone is looking to fuck him in this episode. <laughs> I'm kind of setting up some foreshadowing for potential relationships that might go on later, um, which is pretty funny as well. Um, but the whole cast is great here. A lot of breakout stars I can see um, having some really, really big uh, projects after this one. So definitely a thumbs up for me on Abbott Elementary. However, the same cannot be said for Blackish, the season 8 premiere, which I also stuck around for because, well, I'm, I'm a guy that likes to watch things burn to the ground. Um, you know, it's like a car crash, man. You just can't look away. And, man, Blackish, what a fall from grace, man. What a fall from grace. I would honestly say that Blackish, like, you know, back in its first few seasons, seasons 1 through 4, probably was in my top. 25 favorite sitcoms of all time, right? Probably like top 10 favorite at the time when it was airing, which is huge praise for me because I watch a ton of comedic type stuff and lots of sitcoms. And this one was able to break through and really make itself stand out amongst the competition there. It had a great cast of characters, great uh, performances from all the main style actors there. Um, just had such a relatable, grounded storyline with these um, you know, characters that you could see yourselves in. And that was really the charm of Blackish back in the day. And then somewhere along the line, probably around season four or five, it jumped the shark so freaking far up that the surfboard it was on was floating in outer space, man. This show lost all its relatability, all of its magic within the course of a single year and hasn't looked back since. And man, has it been annoying as shit to try to see this show as it was back in the day now because the storylines have just gotten so far from reality the the basic premise has just gotten so far from where it was back in the day and it just became super preachy super serious um, I don't even think it really was a comedy much anymore, at least back in season seven last year when it was focusing so much on COVID and so much on, you know, politics and stuff. I mean, it just became a fucking preach fest, you know, and it was so disappointing to see. Um, but all that being said, I still felt like there was some left in this show, right? Some, some spark that was left in the show that I really wanted to see come out in season eight, the final season, super heavily advertised, right? This is the final show of, um, or the final season rather of Blackish and, uh, you know, its whole legacy and stuff. And even if it's not a show that you particularly enjoy watching, the fact that it's gone on for this long and it's been on for eight seasons, especially nowadays, is a huge accomplishment. And for any show, when it goes off the air, you know, is a big deal. Um, these networks always try to hype it up. So, you know, all that being said, I really wanted to check out this final season of Blackish and really wanted it to go back to its roots. But this first episode, man, the season eight premiere just left such a bad taste in my mouth that I am not going to watch any other episode from this final season, man. The finale comes around. Pfft, ignore it, man. It is not worth your time, let me tell you. Um, and this episode, I don't even know, like, who decided to come up with this plot because it's so fucking stupid, man. And I'm sorry if this is going to sound, like, really redundant and me just ranting, but I just got to get this out there because... The whole goddamn plot of this episode was that Dre and Bo, right, the two lead characters who, I'll remind you, were super grounded and super relatable at one point, go to a party and meet Michelle Obama and become friends with her in a single night and have her over for dinner. That's the whole fucking plot of this episode, right? It is just so incredibly just annoying to see the progression made that these, you know, very just super grounded likable simple characters have now gotten to the point where the show has you know trumped them up so much and put them on such a high pedestal that they think that they can you know make it with some of the best out there like michelle obama right i mean it's just so like 
mind-blowing to <laughs> see how far gone they've gotten from that original basic storyline, you know? And this is not a dig at Michelle Obama whatsoever, right? She is great. I think that she has a very positive outlook um, as a person, you know, super, super respectable, um, just has a lot of fun, you know, charismatic personality about her. And um, even when she's on shows like this, you know, to start with, like, because this is not the first time she's been on a major sitcom like this. Um, the first time I remember it happening was back on iCarly, um, I Meet the First Woman. And that was a great episode because um, it was it was special to see um, you know, someone as high stature as Michelle Obama being on a show like this, but at least in the context of that show, it made sense because at, for one, the characters on iCarly were always a little bit, you know, more uh, kind of silly and, and fantastical than the characters on Blackish. But at least in the context of iCarly, they're supposed to be famous, right? They, they host this really popular web show. They have an audience. People know who Carly, Sam, and Freddie are in the context of, of iCarly. Um, so it would make sense that, you know, someone like a big celebrity like that would be on the show and would, you know, want to meet these people. But on Blackish, it just seems weird because these are supposed to be like very, you know, simple suburbanites and, and they just happen to stumble across Michelle Obama. And you're saying you became best friends with her over the course of a night because you went out to get fast food. Like, no, 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 no. That did not fucking happen. All right. Stop pretending like it did. And. I don't know. That's just the the one thing about this this episode in particular that I just did not like at all. That they they trumped it up so much to where all these characters now are on such a high pedestal, have such big egos about them. It just lost all relatability and charm for me, and it's just not worth uh, you know checking into any other episodes for the rest of the season, in my opinion. Um, also, one side note about it as well, which was so fucking stupid, um, the whole like joke about it or a lot of the humor where it came from was that when they have dinner with her the night of, they don't want any of the other family member around, right? This is just something for Dre and Bo. That's it. They don't want any of the kids around. They don't want, um, you know, uh, Dre's parents there or anything like that. So they're all going to like, you know, spread out from the house. They're going to go out, do whatever. They cannot meet Michelle Obama, right? Which is dumb, you know, in its own right. But um, anyways, a lot of the humor comes from the idea of that they're all going to band together, all the other characters, and they're going to kind of crash this party. And of all fucking characters they chose to do it with, they motherfucking pulled Zoe back from the dead, man. I swear to God, dog. Zoe appears in this episode, and I, I don't know why. I don't know why she's there. It's the stupidest fucking cameo I've ever seen in my life. Um, Zoe was one of the main characters from back in uh, the original seasons of Blackish. She was the oldest daughter, and she was a great character, right? Had super, super grounded again, relatable, had that family unit, you know, intact. I really like her, but then she had her own show, the spinoff, the one of many, many spinoffs that Blackish would have, uh, Grownish, where she went to college, and that was basically the end of her arc on Blackish, and she hasn't appeared since then. And then, when Michelle Obama's there, and for the final season, she just randomly shows up doing laundry one day. I just, I'm sorry. I, I don't mean to be that guy, you know, because I do like the show, but God, this episode sucks. This, this is one of the worst episodes I've seen in a very long time. So, anyways, rant over, blackish. This was very, very disappointing. I do not recommend anyone check out this final season. Um, yeah, very, very, very let down from this one. Uh, with that said, let's talk about one last show I have here on the schedule that, again, I watched later on in, uh, on streaming, rather, which was American Auto here. Um, a lot of people, I think, really kind of underestimated this show when it first came out, and this is not a show that's doing well. So trying to, you know, be a fan of this and trying to support it is kind of difficult because you know inevitably that it's going to get the axe, you know, and especially for TV, like, that's always the one thing that's always tricky about supporting these types of shows is, you know, you get too invested in it, you get too attached to it, and then eventually, you know, it, it gets canceled, and then you obviously can't, you know, see where the rest of the story goes or where any of these characters end up. So I'm watching this show very reserved, very conservatively, because I know that it's going to get canceled by the end of the season, but I still enjoy it. Um, Anna Gasteyer on it is great from SNL, of course, way back in the day, and she does a great job as the lead here. Um, but yeah, this was episode three of the show, and again, just caught this on streaming. 
Um, if you get a chance, I would say check it out, but like I said, live viewership is just so far down the tank at this point um, that it was it, it got under fucking Judge Steve Harvey, for God's sakes. A courtroom arbitration show hosted by the guy from Family Feud didn't do as well as one of the best written sitcoms on TV right now. So if that just tells you where comedy is in 2022, you know, there you go. Um, but anyways, I, I do like American Auto. I thought this episode was good. Um, but yeah, like I said, just watching this very, very conservatively here on streaming afterwards. So for uh, for Tuesday, the final show that... Uh, and what, that was the final show that I watched, but the uh, last show that I do want to cover here before we move on, uh, This Is Us, right? This was the uh, season six premiere, again, the final season here, and this one was huge. This was absolutely massive, um, nearly 5.5 million viewers, 1.05 for the 18 to 49 demo. I mean, it's not a show that I particularly have any interest in checking out, but uh, it's great that it's getting this sort of response. I think if any show that ends this year voluntarily between this and Blackish, of course, um, This Is Us is just going to like dominate right when it comes to its finale. Um, that could honestly get 10 million live viewers, and I wouldn't be surprised because that show has just been on a you know campaign since 2016, since it aired. Yeah, that sounds about right. 2016. This Is Us, man, uh, still you know quality from what I've heard as well, looking on IMDb and and looking at the comments and everything on spoiler tv uh, it's doing huge you know numbers uh huge fan favorite here uh it's going to wrap up a lot of the big storylines it's left off on from what i've heard as well so uh shout out to this is us man really really powerful show um that just connected with a ton of people there all right let's move on to wednesday here wednesday the 5th of january this by far was the most competitive day for TV, for me at least. There were so many shows that I wanted to watch on Wednesday here. Lots of stuff that I was really excited for that was coming back after hiatus or that was premiering this day um, that I was super excited for. Uh, so much so that obviously I didn't get to watch it all live. So I watched three different shows live and then I saw another one, or I saw another two rather, uh, later on on streaming there. So I had to kind of pick and choose which one to support here. The first one that I wanted to watch that premiered at 8 was The Amazing Race because this is the season premiere. Um, the Amazing Race at one point was my favorite reality show on TV, like even over um, the Gordon Ramsay shows, the cooking shows, whatever, and easily by far far like no question about it the best cbs reality show that they've ever put out um way way better than big brother or survivor those shows suck i can't stand those shows whatsoever um but the amazing race is beautiful it is is just immaculate compared to those um and this was the first season that they aired since 2019 it's been three years since the amazing race uh premiered a season and if you could guess why it is probably already know by now but the big c covid 19 was the reason why they couldn't take uh they couldn't make any of these seasons and then air them later because the whole premise of the show is that they're literally going all over the world doing all these different challenges in all these different countries and that obviously was not going to be able to happen um because of the pandemic there so they had to wait um i think they shot this one back in like the summer into the fall last year in 2021 so between like august and maybe like october or so is when they when they shot it, which that makes sense as far as the timeline is concerned, because that was right before Omicron hit, and that was before we had to kind of go into another lockdown and everything. So that's probably like the best time that they were able to do one. And then obviously now it's airing in the winter. Um, comparable to Survivor and Big Brother, which were able to do uh, extra seasons due to the pandemic, because that's pretty much all the TV we got back in the summer of 2021 was just garbage filler reality tv on all these networks um including big brother and survivor which are already shot in kind of a closed off environment they're kind of already contained in one location to begin with so obviously much easier to do a show like that um you know even without you know with or without a pandemic so um but anyways this was a big deal for the amazing race because it had been so long coming back and I would have watched it if not for the fact that it was a two-hour premiere, which I didn't actually know. I thought it was just one hour, but then I saw that, and I decided not to because it would have cut into Chicago
Chicago Fire, which was the most anticipated show uh, for Wednesday for me. So I decided to skip it. Um, instead, watch Chicago Med here, which was absolutely uh, huge as far as ratings go. Um, easily way bigger than any of the other shows that premiered again back uh, at 8 o'clock there, including The Amazing Race, which probably due to the fact that it had been so long, this was easily the lowest rated premiere that the show ever had. Um, under 4.5 million viewers, which is pretty disappointing considering, but again, you know, three years absence, um, you know, you can't really expect that it's going to do, uh, you know, massive like that um, because people have probably forgotten about it by now. But Men, on the other hand, was huge. Um, this was one of the highest rated of the season thus far, nearly 7 million live viewers, which is great. And then the 0.75 for the 18 to 49. Um, quality wise, this one was pretty forgettable. I'm not going to lie. Um, Chicago Med is definitely the least important for me personally because, again, medical shows just aren't really my bag all that much. Um, definitely more of a fire and PD guy. But, you know, I liked some of the individual storylines here. Um, Dr. Hammer's storyline I thought was good in this one. Um, uh, Dr. Charles I thought was, you know, all right in this episode. He's usually pretty good. Um, in general, he's one of my favorite characters. But again, this one was just kind of middle of the road, pretty average for me. Um, nothing really, you know, too significant to say out of that episode. That being said, though, uh, Chicago Fire, which, as I just mentioned there, was my most anticipated episode of this entire week, pretty much. Like, the biggest premiere that I was expecting uh, for this week here after the huge hiatus that the Chicago shows had. Um, and this one was going to be super important because they left it on a huge cliffhanger here. So I was super hyped for this. Um, between November, like between early November and now in January, they only aired one episode of all the Chicagos. So two months of real time. The only episode they aired was uh, December 8th was their mid-season finale. And that was the last episode we saw. So between then and now, that was a month. And then prior to that, they had another hiatus um, throughout November for Thanksgiving, I guess, or something. Um, so between the episode that aired back in late September and then, uh, wait, no, no, late October and then uh, December, it would have been a month. And then from then and now, it's a month. So anyways, it had been a long time. Uh, it had been two months and one episode. So yeah, I was looking for some Chicago, man, because you know me, I love the Chicago shows. Um, and Fire was definitely the most anticipated because of the Stella and Severide storyline. I don't want to give too much away in case you are not caught up with it. Um, you know, I won't obviously give spoilers or anything. But um, basically Stella's character earlier in the season had to leave the show because of a plot line that her character had, which was gonna be kind of outside the boundaries of where the show you know was showing like outside of the firehouse and stuff and that kind of let her character kind of explore some outside territories which that kind of hurt her relationship with Severide um and this episode was going to be the chance where they meet up again after this whole time of like not you know seeing each other and stuff and then they were going to have that you know talk where she's been gone for so long and you know what's been going on are you cheating on me you know what what have you been doing this whole time you haven't contacted anybody um you know just basically what's going on and stuff and um her response was essentially what they were leading up to in this episode and after watching it it just seemed really kind of cheesy and not you know worth the the weight honestly it just was it just didn't really satisfy you know the way that i was hoping for it and i think a lot of people kind of felt that way too um they didn't really give enough proper time to these two central characters in this episode compared to how they've done it in the past which is kind of silly because the stakes in this one were so much higher you know for this like to to, to go down and this conversation to happen um, compared to other plot lines and more trivial stuff that they've done earlier in the season. So that was just kind of a waste as far as like how they were going to approach it, you know, as far as the writing goes. Um, the other thing with this episode, which I think was kind of their way of, of stretching it out more um, to continue the, uh, the cliffhangers, which I'll mention in a minute here, but 
Um, the action in this episode was way more than they usually do, um, which most of the time is good. But in this case, it's like, no, I want to see these two. I, give me the, the relationship jargon. Give me the soap opera-esque elements here. I like the action. I like the stunts, all that good stuff. But I don't want that now, you know. This is the one time where you shouldn't do that. Um, typically how it's formatted is like the first like 10 or 15 episodes or uh, minutes rather 10 or 15 minutes will be dedicated to like the stunts and the action sets and stuff like that and then the rest of it will be the more uh, soap opera you know cheesy type relationship stuff um, if there's another like little one later in the episode it's usually like an EMT call or like you know something like that um, but this episode the first like 25 minutes was all action. It was all this like, you know, massive fire they were putting out, uh, this chemical fire that they had to deal with, which was entertaining, you know, I'm not, you know, that's cool, and stuff. I like seeing explosions and stuff like that. Um, but it's just not what I was, you know, hoping for based on the, the promos and stuff. So that was a little bit of a letdown there. Um, it was cool seeing Trudy as well from PD made, made a cameo in this episode, which was cool. Um, there was an interesting storyline about Ritter um, who doesn't really get much screen time, so that was nice, but I just, I don't know, man. It just felt like they were focusing on the wrong parts here. They just didn't give enough time to, to Stella, you know? That's that's really the one person I wanted to see most, and she just wasn't in the episode enough, so... Um, but when it ended, you know, the last scene, of course, because they're going to set up the next cliffhanger, had them talking again, and it left it on an even bigger question that was kind of, you know, building off of what we were expecting previously and then still it cuts to black and roll credits you know so we have to wait another week to see that question again and at this point i was just you know kind of fed up with with fire and uh, med you know like i said it was very forgettable so as much as i hate to say it i really didn't want to watch pd because i just you know was kind of frustrated at this point with what nbc was doing um so in lieu of that i ended up watching another show that i was eager you know eager uh, eagerly anticipating as well here on CBS, which was Good Sam uh, with Sophia Bush, new medical drama that had premiered this day as well. Um, and again, it was a little bit of a letdown. It wasn't horrible. Um, it honestly probably was the best thing I saw the entire night, um, believe it or not. But this is just a very, like, you know, cliche just repetitive kind of show that we've seen again a billion times over like if you showed uh an ai like a hundred different episodes of various medical dramas this is what it would give you yeah no this is what it would would it assume the genre is like um it kind of like what i said earlier about the cleaning lady like you know that sort of genre is just very repetitive at this point and there's just not enough uh you know creativity left in it i think to really make something really unique out of it um because medical dramas are a dime a dozen now and and unless you really have something you know unique and and something that stands out about it um you know it's it's just filler at this point um i think people are just kind of tired of it and stuff and that's why you see the ratings here were really really dreadful uh, for good Sam here, uh, despite good marketing and despite the fact that Sophia Butch's name was all over this show, um, I just people are are fed up with medical dramas. You know, they're just bored of it. So not even three million people on the premiere, which is really bad um, in comparison. Of course, Chicago PD definitely the bigger draw of them, which we'll talk about in just a minute here. Um, but good Sam, if you don't know the storyline, we'll just recap that real quick. Um, essentially, Sophia Bush and her dad are um, kind of the leaders and the directors of this hospital, and she's always kind of second banana to him because he's like the you know the main main uh, doctor of the hospital, and you know he's he put his name on it and everything. And when he goes into a coma, she kind of takes over for him and becomes the main uh, you know director of it, and so that kind of create some tension between him and her when he awakes from his coma thinking that he's still in charge and so there's kind of this weird conflict between who actually is you know above one another and who's you know in command essentially and so that's kind of an interesting dynamic between these two characters and the actors that are portraying them jason isaacs is the other lead here and I thought he did a pretty good job as well um but there like i said there just isn't enough you know unique elements to this show to make it stand out from anything else on TV right now uh, compared to like a Grey's Anatomy, a Chicago Med, a New Amsterdam, you know, any of those other 
15 billion medical dramas that are out there, you know, it's just another one in that bucket that, you know, you couldn't really decipher if you didn't know any better. Um, the only other positive I have to say is that it is pretty funny, like, for a, for a drama. Um, there were a couple points where I was, like, you know, laugh out loud laughing, which is definitely um, different than what I was expecting, to be fair. Um, but even outside of that, you know, like I said, unless you really, really love this genre, I think you can skip this one. I don't think there's anything super unique about it um, that's like a must-watch by any means, and I'm not really surprised that um, it had as bad ratings as it was, because I don't think a lot of people um, were expecting like a critical masterpiece or anything. It was just going to serve a very niche audience, which I think is just already really overbloated in this particular genre. So, good Sam you know forget about it just not really anything too unique uh especially compared to pd which when i watched it after the fact on streaming i definitely regretted not seeing this one live because this for me was one of my favorite chicago pd episodes they've done this season or otherwise um i'm a little bit biased in that because it was a kim and adam episode and they are my favorites um especially compared to Haley and jay and all that other crap that they did with them earlier in the season uh, that's all done, right? They are done. That storyline is done, guys. Roy, we, we know what happened. Hank, we know what happened. That They're done, all right? We don't need to see any more episodes dedicated to them. Please, for the rest of the season, give us some Kim and Adam. Kim and Adam stands out there like me. We are fucking thirsty, all right? We're fucking, we need some shit. So this was a great episode because it put them back in the spotlight, man. And Michaela was brought back, which is always awesome. She's always a treat to see. Um, and this was a really kind of momentous episode for Adam specifically. This really brought up a lot of, um, kind of feelings for him. And he was, he, he got some pretty emotional scenes in this one, which was great. Um, him and Kim had a really nice, uh, discussion towards the end of the episode as well, which I thought was going to lead into some more, um, big stuff for the rest of the season. Again, I'm trying to you know, kind of swerve around spoilers here because I don't want to give too much away. Um, but yeah, it was fantastic. This was, this was a huge treat. Um, the case that they did as well, just like the basic, you know, uh, police procedural elements in this one I thought were great as well. Um, so yeah, this was a thumbs up for me. Like I said, this was one of the best of the season so far. Um, definitely looking forward to what they do after this. And then the only other show that I saw on Wednesday, again, that I had to catch up with was Next Level Chef, the second episode here. Um, surprisingly enough, really, really stilted as far as its ratings go, um, probably because of all the other competition it had comparable to Sunday. Um, of course, between Fire and The Amazing Race and even The Connors, which um, The Connors is, you know, as of right now, still the highest rated or one of the higher rated um, ABC sitcoms. So putting it, you know, self against that as well. Um, but this one really kind of plummeted as far as its uh, numbers go. 1.8 million and then 4.6 for the 18 demo, um, which is definitely a lot lesser than we saw in its premiere. But this was the first official elimination challenge they had on this one. Um, so each of the teams here, again, randomly selected to choose who uh, or which kitchen they were um, going to compete in for this one. And the winning dish for you know, like any of the individual contestants would save their entire team from going into the elimination challenge. So that was a really nice sort of, um, you know, plot line, or not plot line, but, you know, element they had on this show as well, um, where, again, you're kind of working as a team. So even if you aren't necessarily, you know, have the best dish, you could still uh, redeem yourself if one of your teammates got, you know, a better uh, dish than you and they were picked as the winner here. So I like that aspect to it. Um, Gordon's team ended up winning here. So then uh, in that case, Naisha and Richard would each have to pick the weakest performer from their team to go into the, the elimination challenge. And then the, those two individual contestants would compete uh, to see who would go home. And that was a really interesting element as well, because when they come out, uh, Richard and Aisha don't know who cooked what, right? They're, you know, lured off stage. Everyone else is watching this. So everyone else knows except for the two coaches that put their contestants in to this battle here, which I thought was really, really cool. Because most of the time on cooking shows, you know, they're, they're micromanaging everything. They see every element. This time they're completely blinded by it. Um, and then when they pick their dish, they don't know who cooked what. So they might be voting against their own 
uh, you know, contestant that's on their actual team there. So that was a really interesting um, sort of element to it. And uh, the person in question, yeah, he, he kind of fumbled the ball, I'm not going to lie. Um, his last dish just, you know, wasn't up to par with uh, the rest of the uh, contestants there. So not too uh, upset to see him go. I think actually I'm rooting for, like when I watch the show, I'm kind of, you know, um, subconsciously rooting for the con for the judges, like as opposed to the contestants. And Richard is my favorite of the three. Richard Blaze is a great chef. He's been on tons of different shows and tons of Food Network shows and stuff. I'm a huge fan of him. So I'm rooting for his team. And the person on his team was the one that was first out, of course. So um, already kind of a bummer there. But like I said, I really like this show. I'm going to stick with it, um, watching it on streaming. Um, if Wednesday is its permanent spot on the schedule, which I think it is, um, you know, I, I won't watch it over Chicago Fire or anything like that, but um, yeah, I'll definitely watch it on the stream there. So that was it for the um, Wednesday lineup here. Like I said, crazy uh, lineup. They're super competitive. Lots of ups and downs here. Um, some great stuff, some really bad stuff that came out on Wednesday there. Um, definitely let me know what you think on this one. Let's move on to the 6th of January, which was Thursday here. Another one with a lot of big premieres, as you can see. There are lots in the green here. Surprisingly enough, again, I only have one show to talk about here on Thursday here, which is not the shows that you might expect it to be. Typically, I'd watch the Law & Order shows here, SVU and Organized Crime. Uh, big confession from me as someone who loves the Law & Order shows and is always kind of preaching you know, for you guys to check them out here. Um, for some reason, between like Thanksgiving and Christmas, and then you know following Christmas into where we are now, I missed a lot of Law and Order. <laughs> like I missed probably like three or four episodes of each show. You know, three or four weeks in a row um, between that you know sort of holiday uh, break there. Because for some reason Thursday, I just always had another you know thing on my itinerary that day i was meeting people i was going out with my friends um we were doing gift exchanges for christmas i was working you know some nights as well so i just for some reason miss like a ton of them in a row and i just haven't been able to have time to catch up on any of it because i'm watching so many other shows of course as we have been discussing here so i actually did not watch these two episodes so i don't know you know quality wise how they've been i really don't know what's going on story wise either um i can kind of gather from some of the promos i've been seeing i'm kind of you know avoiding most of it to avoid spoilers but i think richard wheatley um from organized crime is kind of becoming a main fixture on both shows uh played by dylan mcdermott who i love from season one he hasn't really been in season two all that much so they brought him back um and they're kind of you know investigating and kind of um, piling on to what happened in season one of Organized Crime, and there's some crossovers with SVU. It looks pretty good, um, I gotta say. I'm, I really want to check it out. Um, the last thing that I saw, um, for anyone who, who cares, frankly, for Organized Crime, um, was when Eddie uh, murdered the um, uh, congressman's wife. That was the last thing I saw um, from either show. So that was a, that was a big moment in the show as well there it kind of put eddie um a little bit in a in a predicament there um who's a great character but i don't know if you know that led to anything so anyways i'm getting off topic here but um anyway svu and organized crime there i did not see so the show in question that i did watch on thursday was women of the movement here um this was a really surprising show um as far as like how i kind of came into it because i had no intention on watching this i didn't really know anything about it uh, I didn't know that it was a miniseries, which I did talk about in the previous episode of the podcast that I do like miniseries and I do like the fact that they're very quick, bite-sized, you know, types of shows that you can just watch um, without having these like really long overdue type seasons for them. So that was great. But um, I didn't know much of the story behind this one. I didn't know, you know, what it was going to be. Uh, about or anything like that until I saw a promo for it when I was watching Abbott Elementary. Um, turns out that this show is essentially the um, story of Emmett Till, who back in the 50s was a teenager who got kind of caught up in some of this, um, you know, racism and, and violence that was going on in the South back prior to the Civil Rights Movement, even earlier than that, who back in the 50s um, prior to the, the Civil Rights Movement even, um, was essentially, like, you know, killed for, um, you know, kind of being in the wrong place at the wrong time and kind of, um, 
you know, and as unfortunate as it is just being black, you know, in the South back in the, in the fifties and people just not accepting that sort of stuff, you know, and kind of un, unfairly, um, you know, being uh, targeted because of that reason. So this was an interesting um, you know, idea for a show, but actually what caught my eye for it and the reason why I actually wanted to watch it in the first place was the fact that when they were marketing the show, um, when I saw the promo uh, for, you know, when I watched Abbott Elementary, they had it as TVMA was the rating for this series. And typically for network TV especially, they never go MA. Like, it's it's super rare to see a TV MA rating for any show on network TV. Um, it's very common on cable because they can get away with that stuff, especially if they air it late. So plenty of cable shows have had it over the years. But as far as my knowledge, the only more recent examples of it um, that I can draw to are shows like Hannibal on NBC, which even then, Hannibal, um, it's still up for debate within the fan base if it was or not, because there actually isn't like any evidence to support one way or the other. Some streaming sites that carry it now, uh, you know, past its run, have it as MA, some have it as 14. So it's kind of, you know, again, um, debatable, which it falls under. But violence wise, it's definitely, you know, up there. And I wouldn't be surprised if it was MA. There was one episode that was so bad, it was actually banned from several affiliates. So it, there's a strong case there for it to be, uh, you know, mature audiences only. Um, there's a show called High School USA, which are on Fox back in 2014, something like that, uh, mid 2010s. Uh, it was kind of paired with Axe Cop, which is another adult animated show. Um, High School USA, though, only aired late at night. It was only it was like at 1130 or something like that. Um, and it was on a weird day. It was like Saturdays at 1130 or something, you know, um, so not prime time or anything. But again, was able to get away with M.A., and then um, some shows on Fox or NBC, um, when they air in primetime, will have a viewer discretion as advised kind of, you know, label to them. And that'll be stuff like Family Guy will have that. Um, Gordon Ramsay, we were just talking about him. Um, stuff like uh, Hell's Kitchen, you know, with all the swearing and stuff, will have it sometimes. Um, for NBC, if they air anything uh, related to SNL, if they have like a special of SNL or something, earlier they'll have a viewer discretion and they'll say like you know this material was uh was intended for later viewing and stuff like that so um you know they'll put some disclaimers out there like that but i've never seen abc do it specifically i've never seen them be so you know prominent up front with it being a mature show with um you know language and and violence and stuff and once you know the backstory of Emmett Till, it becomes even more apparent, you know, that this is going to be a really, you know, serious, really heavy show um, with a lot of density to it, you know. So um, that really caught my eye because I was curious how they were going to address this, you know, um, sort of story in a, in a way that was digestible for network TV. Um, actually reading in on it as well. Uh, a couple of the producers originally pitched it to HBO, but they actually passed on it. And that would have been a much more fitting, you know, sort of network for them because they were able to get away with a lot of that stuff because, again, they're on cable there. So that was really fascinating. I was really, really up for watching this. And after seeing it, it's earned its MA for sure. It's earned its MA rating um, more so in language than anything else. The violence on the show wasn't as bad as it could have been. I'll give you that. If you are sensitive to violence, if you don't like blood or, or death or anything like that, it's not as bad as it could have been, but it, it's still, you know, up there. There's definitely some some heavy, you know, subject matter to it. And they do show the body of Emmett Till uh, in the second episode. And it's not pretty by any means. It's it's hard to, you know, digest some of that as well, especially given the, you know, background behind it. But there's definitely a lot of swearing here, and there's plenty of end bombs in the show, um, given its time frame and given the you know subject matter of it. So again, if that's something you're sensitive to, you know, I would I would say uh, go into it very cautiously with that. Um, but yeah, for network TV, like this is this is huge. This is a big big deal for them, um, and I'm really really cool, and I'm really really curious, I should say, um, to see if this kind of leads to anything more going forward. If these networks, if this is a big enough success for them, hypothetically, um, are willing to take more chances like this. Because I think that is one of the reasons why uh, broadcast TV is so kind of, um, you know, ignored, like we were talking about in the previous podcast episode, 
Um, you know, one of the reasons why I think they don't really have the same sort of traction as they once did is because they're so restrictive a lot of the time. Um, they have to be because of, you know, FCC laws and stuff comparable to streaming or cable, which can get, a light, get away with a lot more and just, you know, is more expansive as far as the content they can show. But um, if this is going to open up some doors for that, I think that's huge for, for network TV. Um, and if ABC specifically wants to take more chances of it, that will really push their envelope because they're probably the safest of all the main networks. Um, of course, they're Disney, you know, owned by Disney. So they kind of push that family-friendly image a lot, um, shows about families, right, in their, in their sitcoms and stuff. They don't really have anything like this um, before or after uh, well, maybe not after, but certainly before this, um, they've never pushed it this far. So I was really, really game for, for checking this out. And I think it, it worked really well, you know, um, quality wise. I mean, it's up there. It's got terrific acting, great writing. Um, the storyline is, you know, as, as heavy and dense as it is, I think was portrayed in a really, uh, mature, you know, really, um, you know, grand way, uh, that just makes you interested in the story behind the show as well. Um, and I'm definitely going to stick with it going forward here. Um, assuming that I don't catch up on my law and orders, of course, that being said. Um, so outside of that, that was really the only other, uh, show on Thursday that I wanted to mention. Um, of course, CBS came back with a lot of their sitcoms and kind of, you know, stole the show there with Young Sheldon and Ghosts, um, specifically being the highlights there. Um, Joe Millionaire came back on Fox. It was a bit of a flop. Uh, it was pretty disappointing, I will say. Um, only about 1.7 two million viewers there are definitely the lowest as far as the 18 to 49 demo um just kind of a relic of the past that really hasn't aged all that well um joe millionaire back in the day its first season i think had an average of like 30 million people but that was back in like 2002 or something <laughs> you know i mean that you just don't see those numbers nowadays but um it was a very gimmicky show back in the day it's another one of those like bachelor type you know dating shows where um, there's two people, there's two, you know, contestants and one of them's a millionaire and one's not. And the whole gimmick is like, they're going to date, all these women are going to date these two people and, and see them for who they are aside from their money, you know? And if they end up choosing the millionaire, then that's just a bonus on top of it, but they don't know whose is who, you know? So that's kind of the whole gimmick of it. But to me, that just sounds dumb as hell. That sounds so stupid. Um, again, these like really kind of trivial reality dating type shows are just not my bag whatsoever. So anyways, um, that's uh, for Thursday there. Those were kind of the highlights for it. And outside of that, there really wasn't anything else that I wanted to talk about because um, that was the only other show that I saw this week. But we'll go over Fridays just, I guess, for shits and giggles because they did have a premiere of uh, Undercover Boss, which was another show, um, excuse me, that CBS... Um, didn't really have the most uh, consistent uh, kind of schedule with, like we were talking about earlier with um, The Amazing Race. Undercover Boss is one of those shows that, like, really just kind of comes and goes. Like, they'll have, like, a season, you know, in the spring or something, and it'll be, like, um, you know, 20 episodes or something like that. Or they'll have it on fall, and it'll be 20 episodes. And then when they come to winter, it'll be, like, you know, eight or something like that, you know? They have no consistency with this show. It's just kind of whenever they need some something to fill in with um you know if they have a lull on the schedule somewhere they'll just throw in a few episodes of undercover boss um but for the winter they brought it back on fridays like it originally aired way back in the day um and it did all right you know all things considered it was about four million just under there um so for friday not bad at all but again um you know not a show that it's going to be like one of those that you have to check out you know it's like dire to check out um, I did watch a little bit of Shark Tank. Um, this was the one, if you were paying attention, that uh, was advertised that they had Kevin Hart on it as one of the guest sharks, which, you know, I like Kevin Hart and I like Shark Tank. So, you know, I was kind of curious in that. But again, this is just something I was just kind of, um, you know, watching as background noise, more or less. I wasn't you know, paying attention super hard to it, but it was the biggest show of the day there um, as far as its, its ratings go. And then the 2020 afterwards actually did really well as well. Um, so ABC had a pretty good night on Friday, uh, all things considered. But again, you know, um, just kind of a just kind of a weaker schedule overall. Nothing super interesting. Um, the Olympics, you know, if you're into that, the Winter Olympics um, started this day with the figure skating. So that's cool, I guess. But um, like I said, Friday is just not really that interesting of a day to uh, check out. So 
Anyways, that is it for um, this episode of the podcast here. I know this was a long one and there was some sort of ranting and stuff like that, but hope it wasn't too boring for you guys. Um, of course, I'd love to hear any things that you have to say as well in the comments. Did you check out any of the shows? Um, did you watch any of them? You know, what were your thoughts on some of these premieres as well? If you have anything to say, let me know as well. Um, with that, that is all I have for you guys. Thank you for watching and we will see you in the next one.